Welcome. Today at the Grain Talk webinar, we're going to be talking about grain bin safety. Our guests today are Laura Ferry, our agronomist with Grain Farmers of Ontario, and Dean Anderson. Uh, Dean Anderson is the uh, Strategic Advisor at Agricultural Initiatives, Workplace Safety and Prevention Services. Dean's had many years of experience across North America, and uh, for the last 20 years, has been working in the role of Strategic Advisor in Agricultural Workplace Safety. Um, Want to kind of talk about, about farm safety? And as we get into it, we're going to kind of first talk about some practical experiences that happen on the farm. And Laura, I understand you've had some local experience uh, yourself with some green bin safety with some neighbors and with your dad. Just wonder if you could share some of your experiences with us. Thanks, Marty, so much for that introduction. A little bit about my background. Uh, I live on a farm, I've grown up on a farm, and I currently farm with my family. Um, we grow corn, soybeans, and wheat. I've always been very passionate about safety. I've been involved in workplace safety competitions back in high school at the Ontario and Skills and Canadian Skills Competition. Then later coming back to help judge that competition. I'm active on the Wellington County Farm Safety Association, having held the role of president for a number of years. I got very involved at my local farm safety association after this story that I'm about to tell you. It was a spring day, early in mid, early to maybe mid-April. I was in my third year at the University of Guelph, right in the middle of exams. I think I maybe had one exam left to write. It was an afternoon on the weekend, and I was home at my parents, helping my dad out in the shop and yard, and, well, just getting ready for spring. We noticed a police car flying up our gravel road. Strange, as it's a very quiet road, typically. And that police car turned into our next door neighbor's driveway. Even talking about this now 10 and a half years later, it still gives me, my, gives me chills and it, it makes my stomach drop. Um, my dad and I thought that's unusual. Maybe we should just go up and make sure that all's okay. We'd noticed the neighbors loading some corn into a grain truck, but that happened fairly regularly. When we drove up to their driveway, the two daughters, my friends, were standing out at the end of the lane there to direct in emergency vehicles. They told us that their grandpa, Elmer, had fallen into the silo and was caught up in the corn. We immediately drove up to the silo. We were really the first ones there. There was one police car. The volunteer fire department still had to arrive, as did the paramedics. My dad immediately began helping Elmer's sons. They were in the process of using torches to cut through the harvester silo that was maybe a quarter to a third full of dry corn. From the viewing hole in the silo, they could see Elmer's arms above the corn, so they knew where he was, and they were cutting a hole to try to get to him. I was told to run and gather shovels so that when the hole was cut, they could try to move the grain out as quickly as possible and to get him out. By the time I returned back to the silo with shovels in hand, the fire department had arrived, but it seemed to be somewhat mass confusion, which I'm sure can be so common at many farm-related emergencies. No one is really set up to deal with what they may be walking into. It's not like it's a car accident or something they might deal with on a very, fairly regular basis. After that, it's all there. My friends were there, obviously very upset. I remember seeing Elmer after he'd been pulled out laying on a stretcher. And I remember his granddaughter calling her grandma to tell her she had better come to the farm as grandpa had passed away. My dad, who was heavily involved in getting Elmer out of the silo, remembers once that they got a small hole cut, having a hold of Elmer's hand. And Elmer was also holding his hand until Elmer's hold disappeared. Seconds count in a disaster such as this one. And time had run out. I think in the grand scheme, I'm still a bit in shock about the whole thing. Um, thank you, Marty and Laura, for your story. Um, uh, my name is Dean Anderson. I am going to be talking about um, grain handling safety. Um, today, uh, this is uh, just a slide for um, recognizing that a lot of my material has come from the Canadian Egg Safety Association, which is a non-for-profit. Um, their vision is safe and sustainable agriculture where healthy Canadian farm communities thrive. Um, this is a program that we developed called Be Grain Safe. And I've taken materials from that program, which is meant to be 
both an awareness, but also a first um, responder training tool that's used out there um, to help promote um, safe activities around grain and grain movement. Um, Laura just gave us a, a quick descri description of uh, actually what I would call a, a very typical situation. Um, the picture there, as you can see, is a grain bin. Um, there's, a, there's fire trucks now buried in grain. Uh, there's people wandering around. One of the troubles is when it comes to grain rescue is no one has an active plan. No one knows what to do. Um, no one has thought out the procedure and uh, no negativity to our first responders, but in all honesty, they've spent most of their time either fighting fires or doing car rescues and they don't have the proper awareness. Um, and a lot of them are actually urban now, not rural growing up. They don't understand the concepts moving around grain. Um, so just a quick background. Um, the serious incidents often happen when people are working alone. So I'm gonna discuss a little bit about trying to have a plan for that. Um, when other persons are present, we often end up with multiples. I was telling Marty the other day that two thirds of our fatalities in grain bin incidents are actually the first responders or rescuers, not the victim that was initially trapped in the grain. Um, so that people go in with the best intentions, but because they don't have the proper planning or training, they actually end up becoming the, the victim or we end up with multiples. Incidents um, don't just involve grain entrapment. I'm gonna mention it quickly as we go through here. I want this to be just a reminder to people. I think most people listening to this will know of the hazards or heard of the hazards. I want them to remember such things as mechanical entanglement and things like sweep augers um, is, is just as critical an issue around grain bins. Um, and uh, just re-emphasizing re that point that uh, first responders are often the, the first victim. Um, statistics. Um, I'm not sure if that comes up clear enough. I'm going to tell you tractor runovers and rollovers and being struck by are definitely our killers in agriculture. Animal related ones end up being the first non mechanical. If you move down this list, um, this one down here at 3% is actually grain asphyxiation. Um, and, and that's the one where grain bin entrapment tends to be in confined space. It's about 4%. Um, one of the things that's really raised our awareness is there have been some serious incidents um, occur and, and some of them have been, if you remember back about four or five years ago now, there was a case with three children in a grain incident, in a canola incident in Alberta. Um, and that actually is what stimulated our program for Be Grain Safe. But in 2015, we actually had nine cases in Canada uh, with fatalities. Um, the US usually has about 30 a year. On statistics, we end up with about three a year um, in Canada. So if you take that to Ontario, it's usually only about one a year, but we definitely are seeing a slight rise and increase. And uh, hopefully Laura's story helps remind people. Um, I know of a similar incident that I was aware of probably about 40 years ago, the same thing type, same thing happened. Um, so why do we think we're seeing an increase? Um, the industry is seeing changes. Um, grain storage is changing. We're getting more on farm, especially in Western Canada, but Ontario is still the same. Bins are getting bigger. We're moving larger volumes. Um, we do, um, the fill and unload speeds are dramatically increasing. The example I'll use is that like a six inch auger will move about 2,500 bushels an hour, but a 13 inch auger moves 11,000 bushels an hour. And if you figure that out, that's about three bushels a second. An average person in volume is only two bushels. So if you're moving grain, it takes less than two seconds to physically move a human body into the grain. Um, our grain bins are getting much bigger. Um, I don't think I need to tell you, you know, the size is actually becoming astounding out there. Um, grain handling um, hazards, when looking for the potentials, it's important to understand all the areas that make up the farm handling system. So there's the material, i.e. the grain that you're storing, the people, the workers, the people around, are you working by yourself? The environment, um, inside a grain bin, you could have high concentrations of gases form, such things as um, carbon dioxide if there's fermentation from grain being out of condition. 
um, which would lower your oxygen levels. So you need to be aware of those. And then there's the mechanical components. There's um, moving augers, there's belts, there's possibilities of electrical, electrocution, um, and those kind of things. So it's not just grain that we need to worry about. It's the entire scenario around grain handling. Um, grain as a material has properties. And one of the big things is it generates friction that helps resist you pulling through it. Uh, the example would be in here that if you're buried up to about your knees, it would take about 170 pounds to pull you out. That's your own weight, approximately. If you're buried to your waist, it's going to take over 300 pounds to pull you out. I can tell you, if you put a harness on that person and just try to pull them out, you will do physical damage to joints, um, knees, hips, backs, shoulders, um, those kind of things. Even just being buried to the waist, you cannot easily pull a person out. And once you're buried to your neck, it's going to take 600 pounds to pull you out. And if you're buried and just being able to get a hold of the person and tie something onto them, it's going to be up to half a ton of pressure you're going to put on that person to pull them out. And the other thing is those things put a lot of pressure on the body. So you're getting that internal pressure. So it's much like a constricting, a constricting a boa constrictor. Um, every time you breathe out, the, the grain will push in more and it won't push back out when you breathe the next time. So you end up with those lateral things. Most people think it's kind of buoyant like, like fluid. It, it doesn't work that way. If you lie flat, you'll just sink quicker because <laughs> you're only a foot deep. You're not five feet, six feet tall. Um, so that it, it does tend to, once you're in that fulcrum in the middle of the funnel of grain going down towards um, an augering system, you become the heavy object and you will be the object that sinks the fastest. That's just the physics of it. Here's a couple of examples of grain that's out of condition, just for people who say, well, what's the picture of? The picture on the right is actually a picture of um, a truckload of wheat that had been at 25% moisture. It sat for 12 hours. And you can see how it, it literally pulled down a quick funnel and then it built up this very, um, strange scenario, very steep. And now someone's gone in with a pole to try and work it down. And the other picture is a similar picture. It's, it's a, a load of grain that went in that was too wet into a dry bin. And, and then what's happened is you've ended up with this pyramid of blocked up material in the middle. And I think everyone's heard of these problems and tried to find ways around these solutions. Um, this is actually one of those things of making sure that when you're, oops, that when you're using your grain, you, you try and make sure you're handling it or get it in condition as quick as possible. So one of the biggest risks is that grain being out of condition and then it bridges, it clumps to the side, it freezes to the side um, and, and you end up with it plugging sumps, plugging equipment with big blocks of material. You have that potential for what I'll call an avalanche, whether it's the pyramid or whether it's, it's the sidewall buildup. And then of course you end up with bridging and crusting. And what happens is people now go into the bin to try and solve these pollution, these issues and try and get um, the grain salvaged and moving out of their bin. Why am I hitting twice? Um, the grain materials for entrapment, um, grain kind of acts like fluid, but it doesn't in a manner that what ends up happening in, in the picture, you can see this, the grain flows from the top and down the center to a single auger pulling it out. So that it moves relatively slowly out here, but as you get towards the middle and into here, this is the way the grain moves. So grain moves out of the auger this way, out of the bin. It doesn't move across the bottom. This grain essentially all sits still while you're moving and you empty a bin from the top. So that drawdown point is from the top. It obviously doesn't give you support if you try and walk on it. So one of the big things always said around grain is don't go near it when grain's moving. So any kind of grain movement, you get this kind of thing. That could be the same thing as just riding in a wagon and the grain is now shaking. The heavy object will want to sink to the bottom. More dense objects always sink to the bottom. You put a hat on top of the grain, it'll sink down in the grain. It won't ride on the top. It's, it's heavier than the grain. It'll sink in. Obviously, a person's a lot heavier, so they will sink. Um, the objects do rotate a bit. The trouble with that is sometimes you see people using these rescue tubes. It sometimes means that an appendage, like an arm or a leg, will go out at a weird angle. So, and now you can't put that um, coffer dam around the person to extricate them that way. You've got to find a different way to, to um, initiate the rescue. 
Um, and once submerged, um, the person sort of completely immobilized, you can't immobilize yourself. And one of the issues would be um, cutting a hole, what will end up happening or turning the auger on, your victim will just sink. So you've got to find a way to drain the grain away. And that's why we have courses telling people how to do it properly. The other thing you don't want to do is just cut one hole. It'll offset a bin. And what will happen is the bin will collapse in the other direction. And that often happens in rescues. Um, so this one here, I think, is a bit more of an explanation to that. But you can see this person is now standing on bridged grain. They're trying to figure out how to fix this. They leave the auger on. Let's say it's a person goes in by themselves. What happens if this bridge breaks? I think you can just see the scenario that happens instantly. And I wanted to make sure I had this picture in there so that people could understand and see what was going on. Um, when we say bridging, if you're not aware of it, and then I think you can sort of see how that's going to end up um, in a situation that's going to be hard to solve. Um, this one would be the situation where the, it's on the side. Often what happens is you get your bin empty and then you realize a bunch of grain is stuck to a side. It happens a lot even when you've got grain in relatively good condition, but because of your air movement, you've had moisture freeze, sun's been hitting this side, this side's in the shade, grain freezes up there. So it's not necessarily the grain's way out of condition, it's just moisture in the grain has frozen it and locked it in place. And the trouble is people go inside and then end up being avalanched on. Obviously, if the augers are going at this time, you can also be in some serious condition um, in the rescue situation. Um, oh gosh, I think I actually went by another one. How'd that happen? Yeah, go back one. My finger seems to be a little heavy or something. Uh, the materials are the type of getting done. Um, grain is being dumped from above and a person could be underneath and get buried. That's another way it often happens. Um, I mentioned that quickly the incident that happened in Alberta several years ago, and, and that's the way that incident occurred. And um, often it happens filling um, wagons, so it's not necessarily just grain bins or trucks, semis, um, B trains. Um, and the trouble with that is there's no easy way to get the material out of them without dumping. Um, so you either turn on the bottom hoppers and you have to let the grain run out the bottom, which will just suck your victim down or you end up dumping, or if it's just a grain bin, you have just one opening at the bottom. And all of those scenarios will just pull your victim down further. So having an, another plan on a way of trying to get the victim out is one of those things that's very critical when you're in a situation like this. And I think that's one of the things at the end here, I'm gonna talk about making sure you have a plan of how you might react on the farm. Did it again. I don't know if I do it too quick or not. Um, this one here is just a quick discussion looking at um, this, the, um, the volume of grain moving. Um, this is a 1500, um, a 15, oh gosh. Um, this is how much gets moved with a 4,000 bushel um, auger, how much a 200 pound person, which would be um, in, in one of these scenarios, it shows how fast, these are seconds it shows how fast the person would get buried. So if you're looking at it, it actually is very quick and it doesn't matter if you're you know, 200 pounds or 150 pounds, the time it takes actually goes pretty quick. You're just in. Um, we were gonna put a video in here. If someone wants at the end, I put some links with video shots. It takes about 15 to 20 seconds for an average person to be sucked all the way in so their head's under. It, it happens that fast, you get sucked to your knees, you don't realize it, so that's like five seconds. Now it's 15 seconds till you're buried. Um, if you have an, even have an observer on a tank, it's hard for them to get equipment turned off in time to keep you above the level of the grain, which is one reason why we recommend that people go in, A, with a spotter, but B, with some sort of harness on and can be tied off, because that will stop you from sinking down. Um, and that's, that's the critical part of the rescue. Um, obviously having someone to observe it um, really helps. So here's the picture. Again, my, my graphics are a little bit small. This is your zero timing. This is your second. So five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, 25 seconds. That's how fast it takes to go in. Um, most people think that, um, and, and if, if this was a bin with the, with the funnel on it, 
it would be much slower if you were standing here because the grain is moving horizontal. But if you're getting towards the middle of the bin and it's going straight down, that's when this type of scenario would happen that quickly. Um, so um, you don't get time to react. Lying down flat doesn't make it bear better. You'll just bury yourself quicker. So I've discussed it quickly why people enter the bin. Um, there's various reasons. Um, you can go in just to check. Check the moisture, check how your heating's going. If there's heating going on, um, grain can heat. I've heard of canola bins starting fires, self, con self spontaneous conduct combustion in under 12 hours if canola goes into the proper conditions, the improper conditions for storage. I've heard of bin fires starting with canola in under 12 hours. Um, so knowing what heating's going on, airflow, um, you go in to test it. Pest activity, middle of the winter, go in early spring before it freezes or as freezing comes out, you go in to check if there's pests in there to determine if the bin is ready for additional grain. So you go in just sort of to clean up the bottom, um, that type of thing. Children entering to play. Um, I'm gonna be the first to say I have played in grain as a young kid on my uncle's farms. Um, there are better places to play than in a grain bin. Um, and especially um, grain um, wagons and when you're filling, um, sorry, um, that, that type of scenario is just not the best place for playing. And cleaning bin often requires you have to go in. I mean, I don't know how you clean a bin without going in. So those are just a couple points to remember why you're doing it. Um, things you need to remember as you're getting ready to go into a bin, um, the experience in the previous training of the workers. So, um, your nephew shows up at your farm, never worked on your farm, and you say, please go in and do this. Um, there's some other things you probably need to make them aware of. Um, the speed of a sweep auger working, um, the issues if grain is bridged, um, the issues of how fast to go down, um, the knowledge of procedures that you have on your farm. Um, work habits are terrible. People tend to work alone even when they know they shouldn't. Um, so you know there's a problem in the bin, you're going into the bin, you, you're working by yourself, so you turn on the, the augers to empty it, and you go in to solve a problem, and there's no one else around. Um, you can just see how that's building up to be a situation that's not going to end well. Um, physical capabilities, that's the other thing. Um, sometimes, and, and I'm going to say it both ways here, young people may not, maybe of small enough stature, they can't do what they need to do in there. Older people have issues too, um, heart medicine, bad knees. I think every farmer has a bad knee or a back. Um, so things like that can add to the propensity to have accidents. And cognitive level stress and exhaustion are two of the worst ones out there. Um, you've been combining for 18 hours and now you're gonna do something in the grain bin. Um, not the best time or scenario to do things, um, period. Um, planning your workload and uh, Maybe that's something you do first thing in the morning before you can start combining again. Um, this is that problem. I was talking about stability of the storage structure. This was a case where a person was just unloading it and it wasn't unloading equally. And what happens is um, grain bins are very good for equal stress outward. Most of the grain weight goes down. The second that you're not emptying it on an even level, um, what ends up happening is all the pressure goes to the opposite side of the grain bin and you'll often end up in a situation like this. You could end up being standing next to the bin in this case and now you're buried in grain. So it's, it's also being aware of everything you're doing around the grain and understanding how those things could impact um, your workplace. Uh, um, uh, the workplace hazards. Um, Entrapment, engulfment is a big one. Gases, especially if there's any kind of decomposition. CO2 is the biggest one probably because it's displacing oxygen. Oxygen deficiency um, is done by um, carbon dioxide tends to be heavier than, than air and it displaces the oxygen out. So you might feel good if you're standing up here, but once you get down in this area of the bin, if there has been some kind of fermentation going on, you're gonna end up in a scenario where there um, is, is a low oxygen and you're gonna probably pass out. Bin temperature falls is another big one. Uh, I was talking about uh, rescuers getting, becoming entrapped also. What happens is people rush in and they fall down head first. So now your rescuer is standing next to this person, but they're head down. <laughs> um, 
So now you've got two people that are in a much worse condition. So knowing the hazards that are in the bin is important. And that's something that um, volunteer firefighters are not always aware of because they haven't had the farm background. Um, we like to refer in the occupational health and safety industry uh, as grain bins being a confined space. A confined space is generally recognized as a fully or partially enclosed space, um, i.e. little manhole, restricted means of entering or exit, i.e. little manhole, um, not designed for continuous human occupancy, no one goes in and lives in there, and uh, it, it, it doesn't even have like a regular size door, and there's potential for serious hazards to be in there. So that in what I heard one person once say, they're easy to get into, but not out of. The other thing was think of a firefighter trying to get in there when he's wearing full harness and possibly an air tank because that's what their confined space entry is. And for a firefighter, a grain bin is a confined space and they have to go in following confined space um, directions and they need to follow, um, if they go in through a top, they're gonna have to use roping techniques um, so that you can see that it really is gonna slow down their rescue and understanding how to get there um, it, so it is one of those issues to think of um, when buying a grain bin actually is how the access is there. One of the newest things is, and I think I have a picture in the next slide if I don't go to, um, is when buying a bin is get it set up with a harnessing attachment in the top. Um, usually these have like a temporary cable that runs up here. You put your harness on, you attach your rope and pull the temporary cable out, run the good cable in. And that's what you use for going up and down. Um, and, and then it can be done. The only condition about that is this needs to be an engineered location. Just getting an eye bolt at uh, TSC and attaching it to the top of the bin may not be the best way to put a rescue system in or, or a harnessing system in your grain bin. Um, but they can be done. And there are some companies that actually have them for relatively low cost. Um, they're almost selling them at their cost because they're grain bin companies. Um, there's a couple in the Western Canada, especially that I'm sure would ship it if people were interested in retrofitting. This slide is about having a pre-plan for when you go in, knowing your hazards, using the appropriate PPE, uh, maintaining communication. Inherently in that, that means you're communicating to somebody. Um, that means there's an attendant or somebody. Um, worst case scenario, make sure people know that you are in a bin or you're going in a bin so they can check on you. Um, if there is an observer, the observer should never leave. The observer shouldn't come in. Um, so that uh, they're there to help monitor and, and help regulate calling 911 and or getting a rescue going. Um, we certainly don't want them to come in and become a victim and now no one is going to get help. Um, so working alone is a big issue around this. It can be um, someone who's of a younger age, um, but they need to have the tool then to know how to contact 911 and put that kind of a rescue step into place. Um, the pre-entry checklist will also include things as, is there an emergency plan response? So having the observer, letting the observer know what you're gonna do, how to do it, what's the farm code, um, which bin is it? Is the one, is it the three bins on the left of the barn or the three bins on the right of the barn? Um, isolating power is always important so that, that person who's observing needs to know how to lock out and tag out and or remove the power and before you go in by yourself that's an absolute must make sure that the grain is not moving and make sure the grain can't be turned on while you're in there um, oh Johnny should have been doing this one maybe he went for lunch I'm going to finish filling up the truck um, verify the atmosphere is safe um, usually grain Atmospheres are safe unless there's some condition that's made it not safe, like fermenting. Ensure there's an attendant is always a good idea. Wearing the proper PPE. Having a harness arm and a rope would allow people to tie you off. If you went in without it, how do they get that done? Um, just putting a rope around a person and it's gonna take 900 pounds of pressure to get them out of the grain. Um, it's gonna be much better with a harness than it's gonna be with a rope around under your armpits. And maintaining contact um, with the attendant is an important condition. Um, I think I went by two again. There we go. Components for entanglement. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, this goes anywhere on the farm. 
So you have wrap points, wrap points, your cuff gets caught. You get pull in points with rollers. Um, we just had a serious incident in the province where a fellow got caught in a baler. Um, he's lost part of his arm. Um, so these pull in points are terrible. And then you get shear points, i.e. Um, points like this or a point where the auger meets the tube on the auger um, and they end up being good cutters. Um, I hate to say it, but when I worked in Western Canada, that used to be known as a sign of um, a badge of honor among farm kids. And what the company I worked for out of 30 people in Western Canada, 10 employees were like that. Um, it's not that you're saving a lot of grain when you're brushing in a handful of grain into an auger. Um, find a stick, a broom, something else. Um, components, um, I'm not gonna dwell on this picture, um, these pictures. But you can see how a foot in, a, in an uh, auger across the bottom, sweep augers catching up to people, power takeoffs are a big issue. We have um, a lot of grain augers are driven by PTOs or unloading systems. Um, so just be aware of it. Locking out the power before you get anywhere near these situations. If you have to turn the tractor off, turn the tractor off. If you need to um, get a locking mechanism of some sort to put on um, the circuit, um, to cut it off. It doesn't have to necessarily be a padlock like we would use in a manufacturing situation, but putting a bolt through the, the lock situation would be one. Someone would know it's been done on purpose. You could even use an electric wire tie and put a note to it. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you could just quickly lock out and tag out and that removes the, the issue and it stops anyone from turning it on. And that's the critical thing. If you're in there working, you don't want someone to come along and turn the system on. Um, these are more sophisticated systems. They're easy to get. A system like this allows more than one person to lock out the system and it can't be turned on until both people unlock their padlock. Um, it protects everybody around it, stops even things like electrocution, protects employees, um, having written procedures. And then um, this is a relatively cheap thing to do but it stops equipment from being turned on when you're inside the equipment, inside the bin. Um, so I'm moving a little bit more into what I would do with workers in the workplace. I got about three or four slides left. Um, we would recommend everybody have a safety policy um, with the expectations to comply with that. Um, operating ones, um, who has the authorization to do specific tasks. Um, things that need to be in there is things like lockout, tagout. Um, a checklist um, for completing a method for ensuring your, your atmosphere in the bin is safe, making sure you've got the proper PPE and that people use it. Emergency communications, I think is very critical, especially if someone's working alone, but the recommendation would be in a workplace that no one should ever work alone in, in such a thing as a grain bin. There always should be an observer. Um, responding to the incident, um, Laura, touched on this at the beginning. Um, this, is, this is that double check on your mind, stop, never rush in. We had a case several years ago in a manure situation, fourth person didn't go into the tank, not because of their training, but he knew he didn't have the strength to actually get the victims out in front of him. So he had to go get help. His training failed um, because he was gonna rush in and do the rescue. Um, Shut down, lock out, all unloading. Once an incident has occurred, you don't want any more grain to move until the, until you can start to instigate a rescue. Um, notify um, your 911 immediately, your EMS, get them coming. Um, if you have aeration in the bin, turn the aeration on. Air moving through the grain will help the person if they're entrenched. If there's a roof exhaust, do that too. Air will move through grain. We know that we dry grain down that way. Crowd control, that's one of the things you may want to consider how you're gonna do that. That's also sending a person to the end of the laneway so that 911 knows exactly where to go. Um, assess the situation and resources and then implement situation specific action plan. Um, those are all parts of things that can be done. They can be done on a family farm or an employment farm. Um, but going through these, doing the, um, the case that we do with young children in schools, we tell them to go home and go through a fire escape plan with their parents. It's the same thing. Um, going through this once or twice will help you prepare yourselves and you may go, well, oh heck, the phone in the barn 
doesn't have the 911 number, the, the, the address posted above it. So let's get the address posted above it so they know where it goes. Numbering your bins with big numbers on the outside and you can say the accident's in bin number three. <laughs> Those kind of things help as people pull up with trucks, um, as people pull up in the laneway. And the thing about volunteer firefighters is you may end up with 10 trucks show up because the guys go, oh, I can get there quicker just going straight to the site. Um, so that idea of crowd control or how you're going to manage that for those people knowing that it's the third bin down that's got the problem, those kind of situations being relayed to 911 operators are all very useful. Um, Marty, I think I'm doing good on time. This is one last slide. I think if people want to know more, um, they can go to our website, which is this one, um, and farm safety, um, slash it and go to farm safety. We do manufacturing and services. So our website tends to get buried in a lot of materials. So if you get to the farm safety part, it's better. The Canadian Ag Safety Association, I am on the board. We have a program called Be Grain Safe and there's a number of resources on there. This will take you directly to the English link. There is French material there also. Um, two videos if you're wanting to look at more, or learn more. Um, this first one was one that was done this year by CASA of their grain demonstration trailer. We had it at the outdoor farm show the past two years. Thanks very much to the Grain Farmers of Ontario, by the way, they helped us bring it here. Um, and we did use it for training in Ontario. We've trained about a hundred firefighters with the unit since it's been here, um, it's back out West now. Um, and this one here for anyone who wants to especially relay a story um, to especially someone in their teens that think they're invincible. Uh, this was a Tribeca Film Festival video, it's called Silo. And it's a very good 12 minute video um, story of the impact on a small town in the Midwest um, where an incident did occur. Um, so it's a good one for telling the story. So it's not dad yelling and screaming, you got to follow the rules. Hopefully it'll hit a bit of an emotion and people will watch it and learn from that. So um, with that being said, um, you're always available. This number right here goes to um, our customer care and our customer care service is a consultant on call. And if they can't answer the call because they tend to be one of our people in manufacturing or services, we have about 10 consultants that are either farm kids or have been working in agriculture for about 20 years. Um, so we'll get you to the answer to the person who can find you the answer. Presentation, I do have a couple of questions. I was kind of wondering as we're talking, and I mean, you know, thinking about on averages, you know, one fatality a year because of grain bin entrapment is, is not a good thing to have. Um, I just wondered though, there's probably a lot of mishaps that happen out there and close calls and probably ones that don't get reported, but do you have any idea of how many people probably get caught up in a situation? Like, is, is it more frequent than we think or is it something that happens only once a year, it's nothing, you know, but I mean, yeah, I think, fatality is one too many. I, th I think the, um, the standard answer would be that it's usually a pyramid. So, you know, you get near misses, you get critical incidents, and then you get fatalities. For every fatality, you probably end up with about 10 criticals. Um, so what often happens in grain bins is we get people that get trapped. Um, anyone who's ever trapped in grain, make sure they go to the hospital. Um, they get out and they say they're fine. And then what happens is because of the pressure that's been on their lower extremities, they end up with a thing called compartmentalization and toxins have been built up in their body. And then what happens is they flow and it overloads things like their livers and kidneys. And what happens is the person often collapses, you know, 45 minutes after an accident. So just because they say they're fine, don't take their word for it, make them go to the hospital. Um, and, and then I think probably, you know, if we have one incident in Ontario that ends up in a fatality situation, we probably have somewhere around the range of 50 uh, incidents where someone gets in, they get buried to their knees and uh, everything happens the way it's supposed to. And, uh, they've come out, no one gets called, no one gets phoned, nothing ever happens from it. Um, and that's the same in most situations, right? Um, people yeah. getting off a tractor and it rolls 10 feet ahead, doesn't end up in an accident, but it's the one time your foot gets caught by the back wheel and it runs over you, then we have a run over. Um, and so the same thing happens um, with almost all the types of incidents we have. Um, yeah. So it definitely is, Three a year in Canada, on average, we've had years with nine. Um, often what happens in those years, you end up with multiples, is why, why the numbers tend to spike. It's the same thing as our 
fatalities with workers in the province, which are only 12% of our farming fatalities. 70% are owner operator family member. Um, wow. So it's not workers, it's family members are the highest risk. And, and the thing is that when you end up with bad years for your numbers, your stats now, they tend to be multiples. So we end up with about 20 fatalities a year in Ontario on average. Um, it's a terrible way to ev evaluate things. I do the coroner data pull stuff. It's not fun to read through, but um, you end up with incidents that are multiples and, and those are the ones that really get you. Grain bins, confined spaces, manure storage tend to end up being multiples. Um, so, you know, it's, that three a year may be one accident every three years and three people in one incident. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah, sure. But it, yeah. it is definitely something that could be avoided in most cases. Dean, another question for you. I just wonder about suffocation. Like how quick does that happen? Once you get entrapped, um, you know, a lot of family, loved ones probably think, yeah, how long is it going to take and what, wish for the best, but what's realistic? I think, I think um, the suffocation is probably once the head has gone below the grain level, becomes much worse, much quicker. Um, and the simple fact would be like, I mean, if you think of it being in canola, um, it's going to go into your, your nose and your mouth just like water. Corn, clench your teeth. And, 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 and I've, I've heard people say, grab your hat and put your hat over your face. Um, and, and, the, and if someone's turned the aeration on, I mean, in small breaths, because the grain is going to constrict you, I don't think I can predict how long that suffocation would take. But you can see with something like, you know, if you're you know, a, a grass seed grower or a canola grower or that smaller seed, um, once you've gone below the level, the trouble is your airway, your passageway is going to be compromised. And if, and if you're yelling and screaming, obviously the same thing's going to happen. I mean, I don't want to be graphic about it, but your own calmness may be the part that ends up helping to support you, you know, so not having your hands waving above your head, but maybe holding your arms out from your chest helps keep some of the pressure off your chest. That takes a pretty calm head to think about those things. Yeah, it does. And if the grain's not being shut off, um, the yeah. odds are you're going down. Um, and in all honesty, if they don't know where you are and doing the rescue, that's the, the advantage of your hand being there. They know, yeah, they know how deep you are. Um, but if it's a 30 foot round bin and it's 50 feet tall and it's three quarters full, um, the odds are if no one had been there and someone had to climb down a ladder to turn it off, you're not in the top 10 feet. Um, so it's going to be a rescue, a recovery anyway. Um, and that's, that's, that's the, the sad truth of it is that they don't know what they're looking for. They can't tie on to something. They can't do something. They've got a volume of grain to move. Um, they can't move it with the augering system. They've got to find a different way because they turn the augering system, the victim will be just pulled straight down. So the rescue is going to take a lot longer. Even yeah. just taking out a torch or an angle grinder and cutting into the side of a bin is going to take a lot of time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, it's trying to avoid the situation is more critical. I was going to say, that's the key thing is don't get in that position. Don't put yourself there and do everything you can to prevent it. And, and I mean, my dad taught at the university, so I'm a university brat, but my uncle's farmed dairy farms. So I know the scenarios and I know the quickness and I know what happens in the heat of the season, you know, whether it's oats in the middle of the summer and it's going to rain or it's soybeans now and it's going to rain for a week. It's the same rush. It's the same hurry up. It's the same stressor that ends up and that makes you not think straight and two or three days of 18 hour days and you're cognitively hurt <laughs> it's there's no simple answer back on that one yeah. so yeah. someone else who's thinking right is a better way to think of it so you say i got to clean out the bin today maybe you have the discussion around the kitchen table how are we going to do this how's it going to happen you know yeah. it's the key thing well, Dean, I want to thank you for your time today and sharing the message with us. And Laura, thank you for sharing your personal experience with you as well. I hope a lot of farmers are safe this fall. I know harvest is already underway, but we've still got corn to take off. And a lot of grains can be moving this winter, so I hope farmers can stay safe and we have no fatalities this year for sure. And even those little mishaps, I hope they don't happen yet. Thank you. Thank, thanks for the opportunity, Marty. Um, and if anyone's got any questions, I'm sure you can get them in contact with me. We will. Thank you.
Thanks, Dave. Good.